right, ClubWWI.com members. And a business full of Vinces and Randys and Hulks. Well, only one name springs to mind when you hear the name Ahmed. That's right, he is the former Intercontinental Champion. He is the powerhouse from Pearl River. He is the one and only Mr. Ahmed Johnson. Ahmed, how are you? I'm fine, you? I'm doing good. I'm, uh, I'm actually really excited to have you on the show because, like a lot of our readers and listeners, kind of watched you for years in WWE, and before we get into your career, why don't you fill them in on, on how things are by you in, in the world of Ahmed Johnson? Oh, man, I can't complain. You know, I'm, I've, I've, I've kind of, I've, I've given my life, you know, to the Lord. I've become a Christian. And um, I'm a baby Christian right now. I'm walking. I mean, don't get me wrong. The, the mean streak is still there, but <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> I, have, have you, I mean, that's actually a thing in wrestling. We've, we've interviewed a lot of people who have, uh, in, in the business, who have, who have actually turned to, to Christianity, like Ted DiBiase and, and the Koloffs. And, uh, I mean, have you dealt with a lot of those guys, or is this something that you've just kind of done on your own? No, I've kind of done it on my own. I'm, I, I, I've done it with the help of a good friend of mine named uh, Peter Salvatore and uh, David Vice. And, um, you know, the, the, the walk to Christianity is it's, it's, it's not easy, but it's, it's a great walk once you get there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing, too, I know a lot of people have always said, uh, especially with, with wrestling, is that the business itself and kind of that, that rock star backstage environment, it, it, it does breed that where a lot of people, you know, once you kind of go through that, you get to the point where you kind of you want something else in your life after, after you're done doing that. Right. Well, very, very true. Well, let me ask you this. Will you talk about your career a little bit? Because there's one thing about your career uh, that I, I've, I've brought up so many times, and that's the GWF. Uh, I love the GWF growing up. I used to watch it every day uh, on ESPN. Yeah, man. And, and for me, it's so funny because it kind of seems like it's almost like a forgotten promotion. But, you know, we've interviewed Skandar Akbar, who managed you when you were there. And uh, I mean, what are some of your memories of Global Wrestling? It was definitely a, you know, a great promotion when it was around. Oh, man, Global opened the door for a lot of people. It really did, from Ric Flair to... Uh, you know, the free birds, I mean, it opened up for a lot of people. And like you said, it's forgotten. You know, and a lot of people forgot about Globe. And you, did you hear you mention it? <laughs> Brings back, you know, some good, fun memories, you know. Amino Skandar. Devastation Inc. Yes. That was, uh, I mean, you were actually, I mean, you were part of, uh, I mean, Sebastian. I mean, even people who, you know, went on to, to never end up in, in WWE or, or, you know, TNA or WCW, guys like Sebastian, and even the Davis brothers, Maniac Mike Davis. I mean, just mm -hmm. so many great talents that, you know, a lot of kids today haven't had a chance to see, and, and it's kind of unfortunate they don't have more exposure now. Right. I mean, it's becoming a, a I hate to say this, but, she like it's becoming a dead John, you know, John I mean, it's just not what it used to be. Yeah. It's, I, I, I sometimes compare it to people and I tell them, it seems almost like, like porn for children because it's not mature enough to be for adults sometimes and it's a little too salacious for kids, so it's kind of like, who's the audience here? Exactly. The, do you watch it today at all? Do you have any chances to watch uh, TNA or WWE? I watch WWE, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm I'm watching it more and more here lately, but um, I, I haven't been keeping up with like I should. But I've, I've been watching it. I kind of got a you know problem with with the, the scandalous girls and you know like you said that the poor thing for kids. I mean, yeah, I mean I watch the girls on there and I'm wondering sometimes is it a porn show, <laughs> right? And, you know, there was short shorts on and the butts hanging out. I mean, it was just starting when you were there. It was, uh, you know, Sunny was, was just about to, to start making her start, and it kind of seemed like that just everything exploded after Sable was in Playboy, and, and ever since then it's been kind of downhill with that. Exactly. Well, let me ask you about your time uh, just in the business. First off, we ask a lot of our guests about breaking into the industry. Obviously, early on you were in Global, but uh, breaking into wrestling and, and kind of getting your start, tell me a little bit about, you know, when you first decided you wanted to do this and when you first got into, into training for it. Well, I used to watch it all the time. I don't know if you remember when Mid South, when Paul Bosch, yep, yep, and Mid South running. I actually swept the floors. I was a kid at Mid South Coliseum. <laughs> yeah, and my favorite wrestler back then was Mad Dog Bud Sawyer. Oh man, Mad Dog Bud Sawyer was uh, like an originator of that kind of uh, that kind of hardcore wrestling. 
Yes, uh, and, and I, I kind of try to copy my style after him, him and Steiner. And, um, you know, Mad Dog Bud Sawyer was, was the one that really got me into it because him, you know, and then I can remember Coco Beware. I, there was a, a guy that, was, that had a gimmick. He was a Cuban guy. Uh, his gimmick was Cuban. He smoked a cigar all the time. And I remember he, he did something. He must potato Coco one time. And Coco came out, you know, we did that, that drop kick up the third row. Mm -hmm. He came up one time and he kicked this guy and you could tell there was no fakeness in this kick. And, and then, I mean, that, and between him and Mad Dog, Bus Sawyer and Steiner and Hercules, I mean, they, they, they kind of got me into it, you know, just, just, just by watching them. And, and even Ted DiBiase, tell you a story real quick. When I was a kid, I went to one of the shows one time, and you know, Ted wore that black glove, uh -huh. that heart punch glove. And I was got the, the, the front row seats one time, and I had my hand out for Ted to shake my hand or touch me. I just wanted him to touch me one time. That's when he was teamed up with Dr. Death. Yep. And he walked by me and spit it on my hand. <laughs> wow. <laughs> was, I remember when he got to the WWF, I, I, I told him about it. I said, uh, you know, I was a kid one time, you get, and he said, you got to be kidding me. I said, nope. <laughs> he said, boy, he was kind of nervous. He said, isn't it funny how, you know, history can come back around to get to bite you. I said, yeah, it is. You know, like I got a whole grudge. Just goes, that would have been a payback for you. <laughs> Kids grow up. <laughs> Man. But, yeah, I, I, I got started, though, with Ivan Pusky. Me, Steve Ray, and Booker T all went to the school together. Okay. And a lot of people don't know that. We all trained together. We all started at the same time with Ivan Plusky, Joe Blanchard, uh, Dick Murdoch, uh, Black Bart, um, a lot of the old timers. Even, any, even Johnny Valentine had a hand in, in, in getting me going here and, you know, teaching me the, 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 the tricks of the trade. That's a, that's, I mean, that's a good group to train under. I mean, God, it's like a, a oh, yeah. list. Well, it, it kind of seemed like, I mean, did you, as you got into WWE, I mean, I know we're skipping ahead a little bit, but I want to talk about your style of wrestling because I think one of the things that was so great about, about watching in the ring was the fact that, I mean, you were a powerful wrestler, but it, it was kind of different. It was almost like an updated version of, of the classic powerhouse. He did a lot of things that, you know, Ivan Putsky wouldn't do, but at the same time you still had kind of the overall aura of, of being the powerhouse wrestler. Well, that's what a lot of people say. You, you, I mean, they're kind of on the same note with you on it. A lot of people, I mean, I, just the other day, uh, guy, I got the doctor and a guy, you know, like, oh, aren't you, hey, man, aren't you out there, Johnson? Yeah. <laughs> he was like, you know, I, man, he said, oh, I miss you, man, I miss you. You, you know, he said, we don't have, there's no more tough guys like you, man, in the business anymore. There's no more, no more tough guys. You know, I don't even like watching anymore because, you know, there's no more guys like you in the business. And he was like, uh, I mean, he even remembered when I left, he was like, and he said, you know what match I waited on, man? A lot of people tell me this. He said, it was you and the Undertaker going at it. He said, man, I waited and waited and waited for that, man. Then, you you know, you disappeared. And, you know, I was asking him, you know, I like to ask people, you know, who would you have seen, like to see me go here? Because my style was so, I guess you say brutal. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they was like, you know, two names always come up. I would like to see you go against Undertaker and Brock Lesnar. Be sick. Yeah, Brock Lesnar would be the same. Yeah, that would be a, a, a clash of the Titans. But I tell you what, one of the best matches I had in Global, huh? and it, I mean, it was a hardcore match with respect for each other, was me and Bradshaw. Oh, he was, uh, he was John Hawk oh, back then. Yeah, Johnny Hawk. Man, we had some matches, man, that you would not soon forget. Man. And that's, I mean, it was it was rough. I mean, that was the thing, and especially if if you have a hardcore match. I mean, there's just something about having a hardcore match at the Sportatorium that just makes it so much more of a hardcore. I mean, that's like a an institution at the time. I mean, it's gone now, but back then it was. Uh, you know, you watched wrestling from the Sportatorium, and it just had that feel to it. Yeah, the Sportatorium was just it was wrestling was personified. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. it, it was made for that. It, it was made for that, man. But. You know, and, and these days, I mean, I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I don't, there's, 
besides the Undertaker, I don't know any more, you know, tough guys are left in the business. I mean, I, I actually agree with you. I think that one of the things that I've noticed is that you never went through, you and, and even the whole nation of domination in that whole time period when you were, you were on top with WWE, was that uh, nowadays it kind of seems like everybody has to go through this one phase where they have to look silly. You know, Big Show has to have his face. Exactly. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's and with you guys, that never happened. You guys always kind of you kept on top and you kept, uh, you know, that aura of, of being the tough guys without having to, to do any comedy just to break it up for some reason. I think what was good about what was good about Vince back, you know, uh, back then was, like you said, he noticed the real tough people. He didn't make you go through the the the, the silly phase. He knew it was more real to me. He he could, you know look at you and he could tell this guy is somebody who in the streets you just wouldn't want to mess with. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and that's how he played it up, and the fans seemed to love it that way. Like, when he put me with the nation at one time, for that short period of time, yep. I remember he called us to the office after we had a, a match. He called us to the office, probably after the first or second match, and he said, oh, man, he said, I've got to take you out to the nation. I'm like, what? I just went through all of this stuff to get in the nation? Turning my fans against me, making them hate me, and now you're going to pull me out? And he said, let me, let me, let me show you why. He said, I want you all to see this. And he had a TV in his office, and he pushed it. And to watch me, Mark Henry, Farouk, The Rock, uh, D'Lo Brown, Kama, who else was with us at the time? Was and like Clarence Mason there? Was there was he gone by then? Well, yeah. I mean, he yeah, was. well, I think that was it for the rest of it. Yeah. But, yeah, but to watch us. I mean, here you got these five black guys, I mean, huge black guys, <laughs> mean tough black guys coming down the ramp. It was scary. I was even scared to watch this come down the ramp. <laughs> and he said, uh, nobody is going to believe y'all can be beat. In reality, he said, I mean, in reality, if this was real in the streets, who could I put against you guys? And I'm like, well, I understand. You know, after, after he showed us, I understood. And then when he, you know, put me out the nation, put me back as solo. Mm -hmm. Well, at the time, too, the, the, the baby, I mean, I think people have to look back on the time period to really understand that that's true, because, I mean, there was The Undertaker, obviously, who you brought up, but then, like, uh, Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, it always kind of seemed like, I mean, Shawn Michaels, is, you know, he's a great high flyer, but in there against you guys, it kind of would have looked a little off, you know? Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't look good. You know, it, I mean, you put The Undertaker, now, I could have seen... And still, there was something not real about it, but I could see, could have seen Undertaker, Psycho Sid, uh, Vader, you know, and maybe Rashaw. That part would have been good to me against us. Well, it was, it was such a weird turn, too. That's something I always wanted to ask you about, because I remember, I think it was WWF Magazine had an article about how, uh, it was right before you turned about it. you were in a gang, and that's why, and I remember reading it being so confused by the way it was put out there. I mean, your turn was, it happened, but I mean, was it the kind of thing that, do you feel it went well? How was it approached to you when they first said, we want you to uh, to join the nation? Because it wasn't even almost like, it didn't seem like you really turned on anybody, you just kind of just one day, you were you were going to join the nation of domination. Well, it was, it was I, I, I agree with you, the, 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 the turn was kind of weird. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a overnight decision, it seemed like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I had no say so as far as whether I wanted to or not, which I didn't mind because I, I, I trusted Vince totally. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, I trusted him totally. But growing up in the gang in the blood, you know, and growing up in the gang, and that's why I, the little secret I'll tell you, the two people don't know, that's why I always wore red. If you notice, front trunks, my boots, and my armbands were always red. Okay. And uh, it was paying homage to the bloods, you know. Right. Yeah, that's our game colors. But it it was joining them, I kind of liked it because it was kind of like being back in the game. Mm -hmm. I mean. But it also brought me some bad memories. Okay. But, I mean, I, I had no say-so as to, I went, <laughs> it's not like, this is the boss and that's it. It's not like, you, you know, you get a choice of what you're going to do. Well, that was, I mean, that was the one thing that I questioned with it was that, I, mean, I think what was weird about it was that you were feuding with them, and then all of a sudden the storyline that kind of brought you with them was that you had a history with gangs, and I was like, well, wait a minute, then where, where was the feud from before? What were you mad about that? And I think 
it, it definitely seemed like they didn't explain it, but, I mean, to your guys' credit, I think you guys made it work, and, and in the end, I mean, a lot of people remember, you know, you and, and the nation, whether feuding or apart, it's kind of, uh, I mean, it's, it's a huge part of your career that I think people remember first when they think about, you know, some of the things you did. Well, I, I, I agree. Well, let me ask you this, because this is something that I, I'm curious about, because we've talked to different people who have had similar accolades, and it's always kind of uh, a, a double-edged sword with some people. And you were the first African-American intercontinental champion. Uh-huh. And some people, I mean, it's a great it's a great honor, but then there's also some people who say, yeah, you know, that I don't like to be, you know, I like to just be called an intercontinental champion. For you getting the, the honor to be the, uh, you know, not only the IC champion, but the first African-American to you, is, is it really that big of a deal that... that you were the first one to be, you know, African American and held the belt, or is it just important enough for you that you're a former champion? To be, you know what? Yeah, it's fun. I mean, I'm glad you had that question. You're the first person I ever interviewed with that that asked that question. I'm so glad you asked it. But it wasn't a big deal to me to be the first African American. I was just happy to be the champion. You know, kids that, that come from the streets and gang and. Then all of a sudden here I am, uh, the, the uh, intercontinental champion of the world, you know, and it, it wasn't really a big deal. And then I think the people made more of a deal of it than I did because uh, some of the other black people, were, you know, that I, I ran into, they, the, their question was, well, I mean, you know, it was an honor, but it really wasn't. I made you think about it because... It was 19, you know, 90-something, and it took them that long to crown a black man champion. Think about it, man. And I never thought about it that way until, you know, somebody brought it to my attention. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, that, that's kind of weird that I, I just, it just didn't really bother me about being black, period. Yeah. You know, just being a champion, I, I was happy because, I mean, they treated me good. They, they treated me, I mean, they treated me very thoroughly. You know, and, 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 like, people ask me questions about Vince all the time. You know, I hear he's a, you know, a jerk, I he's an asshole. You know, all I can do, man, is, and this is not kissing Vince's ass or anything, all I can do as a man, and any true man, all you can do is speak on the way a man treats you. Just like you, for instance. You're calling me, interviewing me, you can call some people and say, oh, Ben Johnson's an asshole, he's mean, you know. You know, want to interview? He told he's missing. Yeah, but to them, I may have been that. Okay. But all you can judge me by is the way I treated you when you called me. Absolutely. No, I know you know what you're saying. What right, you know that? And that's where I see Vince McMahon. All I can do is judge him by the way he treated me, and he treated me like gold. That's. I mean, and and, and I think it's great that you say that because that's. That's actually a theme that's come up with a lot of people that, I, that I've heard from. And I think the best one, I think I told you uh, two weeks ago we had Terry Funk on. And Terry had said in his interview that he doesn't agree with Vince's theory and philosophy on wrestling, but he says that Vince is one of the most compassionate people when it comes to his employees. And he says that you right. disagree with his I philosophy. Agree. Yeah. I agree totally. I mean, I, mean I have nothing bad to about the man, you know. I mean, he, he treated me like gold. And when I left, the only reason I did leave, and I didn't tell Vince because I wasn't a crybaby, mm-hmm. was the fact that, you know, my sister was dying. Okay. And she, and she died, you know, like three days after I, I walked out the door, that every up, and they didn't know I was dealing with that, you know. And then they go, oh, yeah, man, don't you prima donna here? No, my sister was dying of cancer. My mom died of cancer. And then my, and my, my older sister was dying, and then she passed away three days after I left out the door. And maybe I should have told Vince that, you know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. But I didn't. I didn't. I didn't want, you know, that on his head. And I, I didn't want him, you know, I, I just didn't want to tell anybody. It was, I, I've always dealt with my own problems. I mean, you know, growing up in a gang and being shot and, you know, growing up as a kid by yourself in a beautiful house home, you learn to just deal with your problems. Yeah. And that, that i got to be honest with you, that's one thing in my life I do regret is not telling him. And if I ever get a chance, I'm going to tell him. But, I mean, yeah, my sister was dying, man, and I got a phone call uh, the day before the match, you know, from my brother telling me I need to get down there. The doctor said we need to, you know, get down there and say goodbyes. And that was killing me. Okay. It was killing me, man. That's, uh, and it's the kind of thing now where, I mean, it, it's, have you ever had a chance to... to to speak to anybody in the comments, somebody that you knew would be able to get the word back to Vince. Have you ever had a chance to explain explain why it happened? No. No. Okay. Never. 
You're, you're only the second person I ever told this during an interview, the second one. Oh, wow. I mean, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing where, I mean, in, in this business, they're so used to a lot of people who kind of wear their hearts on their sleeves, you know, and, and they, I don't want to say, you know, use things or whatever. I mean, but there's so many people in this business who will tell you their entire life story for the sake of, you know, getting compassion right. or getting whatever. So, I mean, it's, it's such a rare thing in the industry to find somebody who keeps their private life private, almost, in, in, your, in your case, as it sounds from hearing you, almost to a, to a detriment that you kept it to yourself and didn't want to, you know, come off like you were using it for, for any other sort of reason. Exactly. I mean, who will walk away just walk out the door from a million dollar contract? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it was it was to the point it was it was killing me, man. It was killing me for a while, and you know it was even killing me, you know, to the point where you know I, I mean, I was thinking about committing suicide myself for a minute. Yeah. You know, and I never told anybody that. Hey, you're the first person I ever told that to. Besides, you know, Peter Salvador and David Vice is a good friend of mine. But, you know, you're the only person I ever go to in an interview. But, yeah, I mean, it got to the point where I just wanted to die with her, you know. And then when my brother called me the, the, the day before, I had, you know, we had the match the next day. I hadn't had any sleep. I wasn't thinking straight, you know. I went out and, 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 and had some liquor. And I don't, I don't even, I don't drink alcohol, period. But I was trying to do everything in my power to go to sleep and to get that off my mind. And. I, I, I took a, you know, stupid route and went, and, you know, and, and to a bar that night and drunk and, I mean, it was, you know, I did, you know, it, it was a, it was a move in my life that I, I would take back if I could. And Steph, I mean, I think it's, it's one of those things where you kind of, you look back and you're like, if I knew then, kind of, you know, the maturity and the things that I've learned about life now, it, it probably would have done things exactly. very different. It is. I mean, uh, I mean, I think this is the kind of story, and this is something that we've talked about before, is that so often uh, wrestling fans kind of think they know stories. And that's one of the things, too, a lot of people, you know, they say, oh, well, I'm a Johnson left because, and, and they usually plug something in that they may have heard once or twice. Uh, and this is something I've never heard. I've, I've never heard this before. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's the kind of thing where, you know, a lot of wrestling fans sometimes assume they know the real story when they don't. Yeah, and, it, you know, and, it, and honestly, between me, I mean, it took me to this point to get to the point where I could tell, you know, speaking about with you on an interview. I mean, it was something I, I, I carried in, in, in my black bag, and I kept it locked in there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's to the point now where I feel like, you know, hey, you, you need to let people know what, you know, what, what really went on, what really happened. Yeah. You know, and... I mean, and she died three days after I left, and that was definitely it for me, you know, as far as wrestling goes or anything else, because I, I didn't know which way to turn. I didn't know where I was going. And that's the kind of industry, too, where, like, I mean, it, it's not like you're, uh, you're working at the post office where you say, I'm going to take a week off. I mean, this exactly. is kind of you got to go every day. Exactly. That's been crazy. Oh, well, I mean, this is just on top of, of a lot of other things you had going. I mean, you also had you had kidney trouble for a while, which, which pulled you out yeah. for a while, too. I mean, tell, tell me about that, because you were actually, you were at a point where things are going up, things are going up, things are going up, and all of a sudden, it was almost like it couldn't have happened at a worse possible time for you. Right, that big kick group gave me, which I found out later during one of his interviews, that he did it on purpose, and I didn't, I didn't know that he had. <laughs> oh, yeah? This, like, yeah, he did an interview, and um, he uh, said on an interview that he did it on purpose, and, and he was honest about it. He said, you know, he was... Jealous because he had already heard the rumors about them making me the first black intercontinental champion, and he said he had been in the business so long and had paid his dues, and you know he felt that was an honor restored on him. And here I was taking it away from him, and so that kick he gave me was was real. He didn't mean to kick me in the kidneys; he meant to kick me in the ribs. He said to break my rib okay. that he got me in the kidney. Wow. So yeah, that was he. He did that for real, bro. That was uh, he. He on purposely did that to, to, to try to take me out. Man, and he did a pretty good job at it. That makes no sense to me. I mean, we've heard of things similar to that too. I mean, shouldn't he be kicking the writers? I mean, why? What, what did you do besides show up to work and get offered something? I mean, it just doesn't yeah, exactly. Make it's really weird. And you had a, did you have a good relationship with him? Were you guys, I mean, did you think? Yeah, we, we, we made up then. We became real friends. We, we became road doll after a while. I mean, when I got I got him back, and I don't know if you remember that time, I, I, uh, I think I got took him to that table when me and Road Warriors teamed up. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And then I picked him up and gave him a pro road through the table and broke quite a few of his ribs. <laughs> so I got, I, got my, I got my payback, and we got to call it. Truth from there. <laughs> We're good to go now. <laughs> I mean, 
you had a chance too. I mean, you worked with. I mean, I think a lot of people. You know, I look back and I was looking at some of the old you know, matches that you had. I mean, you pin the Rock. I mean, that's something that you could probably tell people. You know, for yeah, right. three times. Damn. That's gonna three be times. <laughs> you <laughs> never beat me once. The Rock never beat me. Did you have any idea that he would end up being what he ended up being? Mm, you know, after I after he got started. I, I never figured he would be a bigger star. Yeah, but I knew he was going to be a star. Okay. I knew he would be a star. When he first came out, I mean, the, the difference over the years, I mean, when he first came out, he had that weird kind of hair and the streamers around yeah, that, the back. That chia pet haircut he had. <laughs> it was very weird, I remember. But then when eventually it was with you guys, when he joined the nation and, and really started uh, playing heel is when it worked. Yeah, when he became heel, he was, he was a hell of a heel. Oh, yeah. And what I liked about our styles were they were totally different, you know. I always tell people I, I wrestled as a heel, but the fans loved me for some reason. I could never figure that out because my style was brutal. Uh-huh. And, you no, know, and but the fans loved me, and I don't like that. Well, I, mean, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was... It's almost like today with the U.S. I mean, people, they, they watch a lot of the U.S.C. guy. I mean, do you watch it all, shoot fighting or any of the... Uh... Oh, I love U.S.C. Oh, man. Do you... Uh... I, mean, I go to classes, man. I've been doing... I've been doing U.S.C. classes now for five years. Oh, wow, really? Mm-hmm. Oh, man. I mean, how was... Uh... I mean, who are some of the people you watch in there? Cause I, I immediately, I think a lot of people would think of uh, of Kimbo Slice. He's bald. He's got the big beard. and He beats people up over in uh, in Pride. I mean, who are some of the people that you, uh, that you watch in U.S.C. and enjoy watching? I like Rampage. Mm-hmm. I like uh, I, I, I like Chuck Waddell. I like Randy Couture. Uh, those, those, those are my favorites. Okay. Those are my favorites. It kind of seems like that's the you know if you were to be in wrestling today, it kind of seems like that would be a fitting gimmick for you because those guys are. And that's the whole thing. They they look like and they seem like the kind of guys who could fight you because know, they can you know obviously fight you. Mm-hmm. You know as opposed to and in wrestling we talked about it before some of the the more kind of funny kind of comical things. It kind of seems like that would be uh, that would be the kind of thing that you would do today. That's, 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 I never thought about it, but that, that's true. Mm-hmm. Very true. Is there any thoughts on your part about one day uh, you know possibly making a return maybe TNA uh, or WWE? Yeah, WWE. For sure, I, I feel like I owe Vince. I mean, I, I owe him, man, because of the way I left. I owe him because of the way he treated me. I, I you know, I owe the fans. I, owe, I, owe the, I feel like I owe the fans to come back. And everybody wants to see me and the taker, you know, lock up. I mean, they want to see who will win out of that match. And I like to know who went out of that match. But with TNA, I don't, I don't me and Jeff Jarrett were the best friends. So I don't think I'll be going to TNA anytime soon. That was, yeah, I think a lot of people bring that up, that you guys had that, that feud where he beat you by DQ and then he was gone right after that. Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, we, we wasn't uh, <laughs> the best friends. But I don't think he would be bringing me into TNA anytime soon. <laughs> and I've heard from some people, sometimes Jeff, uh, Jeff sometimes says things before uh, his mind has a chance to really <laughs> decide yeah. what's coming out. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, because one of the other things that a lot of people uh, bring up is your stint in WCW which makes your, your training with Stevie Ray and Booker T all that more interesting to us because uh, you actually replaced Booker T and, and you were Big T in, uh, mm-hmm. in kind of the New Harlem Heat. Tell me a little bit about that decision because he was really, and he was moving up at the time. It must have been kind of a tough spot for you because, you know, obviously there's a comparison. You're teaming up with Stevie Ray, but on top of it, I mean, you have T right in your name too. Was it a tough spot to do? Yeah, it, it really was, because when, when they came, uh, Steve Ray and Vince Russo called me, and they came to Houston one time, they called me, I'm going to come have dinner with them. Okay. And I pretty much got, you know, no, no, chat, chat, get back together, buddy, chat. And you all know, of a sudden, this Stevie was like, man, I really need you to come step in, man, and give me a hand. And then Vince Russo, who I love to death, was a great writer, uh, you know, he was like, I oh, mean, we really need you to step in, man, and if you could do us this favor. I couldn't tell them no, you know, but I was, man, I was 415 pounds. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. I knew you got bigger. 415 pounds. Wow. And I was not in any shape to wrestle. I mean, when I walked from the curtain to the ring, then, it was, (laughs) I mean, I was already out of breath. Yeah. It, it It was bad, but I just couldn't tell them no. So, yeah, it was a very difficult, and then I felt like, a two dollar whore. I really did. I feel like I was 
turn my back on Vince, you know, which I never wanted to do. I really, I feel kept out, man. I really did. I feel cheap. Uh-huh. So I feel like I was, I was doing something dirty. You know, when you're, when you're, you're a friend of mine, and I'm loyal to you, I'm loyal to you to the end. Yeah. I mean, if you're a friend, you're a friend to the end. And, and I feel like I was really doing something dirty, you know, to dance. Well, time period, it kind of seemed like there was a lot of, it, it, it wasn't the kind of situation where you could just leave WWE and go to WCW. It was almost, it, it was a war. I mean, there were people who were, you know, you had Medusa throwing out the title and things like that. So it kind of put you in company of people who were doing that at the time, too. Right, and then, you know, I left when I left WWE, uh, e, I left, you know, nobody beat me for the title, I was still in front of them when I left, uh-huh. and I left naked, you know, nobody ever beat me, and as far as I'm concerned, it's still my title. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still scared because nobody ever beat me for it. So, if there's nobody legitimately beat me for that title, that, that title to me is just float. It's a piece of metal out there floating. But it, 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 it was, yeah, you're right. It was, it was not a good transition mentally for me. Okay. But well, I mean, I feel like I, I, I mean, Stevie, me and Stevie been buddies since we were kids, man. And I feel like I, you know, I couldn't tell, he's like my brother, man. I can't tell him to tell, tell him no. Yeah. He's on the same note, I feel like I was, you know, cheating in a relationship or something on Vince, you know. But that's a loyalty, I think, a lot of, I mean, the, the fact that you're saying that, because I've, I've interviewed people who have done very similar things to that, and it's rare that you hear that. It seems like, you know, a loyalty like that in this business is, is such a rare thing for somebody to have, you know, even even a small feeling of guilt over a situation like that. It, it's rare. Yeah, you know, and, and, and then some people think it's weird, but it's exactly how I feel. I feel like I was cheating. I mean, not just on, on Vince, you know, Vince more so than anybody, but even the fans of WWE. I, it was just a very, very different. It almost seemed like you, you didn't really belong there. I mean, I think so many people they remember Ahmed Johnson, and and the funny thing is, so many people who remember you so vividly from WWF don't. Some of them don't even remember that you were in WCW because it almost seemed like it just didn't. But that's just like, weird. That's true. I mean, I tell people like the guy I talked about that he was. I mean, he knew my history from front to back. Oh man! But he didn't know I was in WCW. Wow. And I'm like. Man, well, that just a, a, a vanishing moment or what? <laughs> Reaffirms it, I think, that it, which just wasn't meant to be. Right. It feels that way. Well, what well, except even then they wanted me to do, like, when they asked me to do interviews against the WWF in, uh, at that time, yep. the WWE at the time, they wanted me to do interviews against them, you know, talking about them. And I refused. Okay. I refused. I would not have If you look back in the WCW case, I guess you, you would never see one negative, nowhere near negative interview I ever did on WWE, and they begged me to do one, and I would not do it. Man. I mean, that's another thing, too. I mean, a lot of people were, were eager to jump out, and it's funny, too, because in the long run, a lot of people who did it and thought it was going to bring them all this great acclaim and everything, you know, six years later, they, he bought it out, and now they're <laughs> they're kind of screwed in the water because they, uh, yeah. they jumped on the train. Totally. Well, a couple of other questions I want to ask you about real quick uh, as we start to finish up. Um, the name. Ahmed Johnson. Um, originally, I know when you came in, I think you were, you were booked as Ahmed Williams was one of the names they had you use. Uh, and I was curious about the name, where it came about, and uh, if it was just something that they faxed over to you, if there was actually some reason behind it. No, just something they faxed over to me, where it came from, I don't know. <laughs> what would you think? <laughs> when, when they gave me that name, I freaked out. I was like, what the hell is Ahmed Johnson? I mean, like I was Muslim, you know what I'm saying? Well, yeah. But I think, I think what they were thinking, and I never confirmed this, nobody ever said it, this is just my philosophy. Okay. I think what they were thinking was Ahmed Johnson, and they had already grasped up the nation. They wanted to start the nation. Okay. See, the nation is a Muslim group. They're supposed to be in, like, Louis Farrakhan, you know what I'm saying, the Muslim. Mm-hmm. And Ahmed would have been perfect as far as the name fit into the nation because that's a Muslim name. And I think their whole intention at first was to put me in the nation or had me lead up the nation. But Vince always said he loved me so much as a solo rap that never transpired. All right. Well, I, was thinking, because, I mean, there's a couple well, other names that they had, like um, uh, Brock, Bronson or something. They, they had a couple other names that I liked. Uh-huh. But Ahmed Johnson was one they wanted to use, and I think that 
you know, just, just thinking back on it, I'm thinking that, that was their whole idea was to, to put me over the nation. Man. With our med name, I mean, because it'll fit right in. I mean, and Farouk, I mean, it's just two Muslim names. Well, know? yeah, I mean, his original name was, as I said before, his full name was, I think, Farouk Assad when he first showed up, which is exactly. definitely... Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's uh, it's one of those, I mean, and it's funny, too, because I don't think, not too many people have even questioned it, and it just became your name, and it just, for some reason, it just stuck, and it, it seemed to, like, just fit you perfectly. Yeah, you got Farouk Assad, Ahmed Johnson, Kama Mustafa, I mean, you know, you got all these Muslim names, you know, I think that was their, their agenda was to, to make it a, a big Muslim group and for me to be in it, but then, once I was doing my solo, I mean, like, my first match I remember I ever did for WWE, the fans, I mean, were on their feet, I got to stay in ovation, and I think that from there was like, you know, this kid is just, it's going to be on his own. Yeah. That's always kind of a, it's almost like a WWE kind of like a uh, trademark that they do where they'll, they'll address like a hot button thing, like a Muslim kind of group, but they'll use African American wrestlers. Like Brother Love was preaching the word of love and not God. <laughs> it's just that one small different change they make. Uh, let me ask you, because one of the other things you got to do, which is amazing to anybody who watched him growing up, Yokozuna, you slammed Yokozuna, which was... Mm -hmm. I mean, tell me about that, because, I mean, if you watched WWF before you got in, that probably meant a lot. Man, brother, that was a backbreaker, I'm telling you. <laughs> he was, uh, I, I, you know, when you do shit on a block, you get no respect, first of all. No. And they don't like you. The, the veterans don't like you, especially when you're getting a push. Yep. And uh, I remember, you know, Vince told what he wanted me to do. He wanted to slam Yoko. And Yoko told me... Uh, I hope you can pick me up because I'm not jumping. <laughs> what? No. He's like, I'm not helping you. And I'm like, you know, what's that shit all about? And then he said, uh, well, you know, I'm going to wrestle, so I'm going to be tired. So if you're going to do it, you're going to have to do it. So when I did it, man, that was all me. Oh, wow. I mean, when I, and, you know, Joe, I love him that, you know, he's another guy I had a conversation with, uh, you know, running with before we became buddies. Okay. But when I put my hand underneath him, man, I swear to God, my hand just disappeared. <laughs> oh, man. And I just gave him everything I got. And, man, I thought I was going to have a bowel movement when I picked him up. <laughs> I mean, it was that much strength. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> That much strength. It didn't have to turn him and flip him. Damn. Oh, I didn't want to hurt him. I definitely would have been in the hot water with the veterans if I'd have hurt him. Yeah. But I picked him up and I flipped him and just let him go as soon as possible. I, did, yeah, I mean, you bring up a lot of that, and that's something a lot of the, the new guys to, to WWE and WWF went through is that kind of that hazing process. But, I mean, obviously, you were able to hold your own. I mean, did that help the fact that you were able to kind of take some of, some of the stuff guys were giving you and not back down? I mean, it, had you been, you know, 190 pounds, do you think uh, you would have gone, uh, you know, to stay in the locker room as long as you were able to? No, I, I don't. I don't. I don't think I would have been upstairs in the locker room. I, I think you, you know you 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 hit the nail on the head with that. I mean, me being from the streets and you know and and not taking any already, um, you know already dressed and not taking any bullshit from anybody or, or, or you know not letting anybody you know pick on me. You know, and I think the boys kind of read through that. And they were like, you know, you get the phony tough in the WWE, and then you get the legitimate tough. And this kid here is a uh, legitimate tough. Man. He's not somebody you want to, you know, get into a scuffle with. And so they they did hate me a bit, but they knew, you know, there was a limit to it. Now, I tell you, who didn't care about my gang membership or anything else was Owen Hart. Really? Who I love to death, man. Okay. I remember when my, my first WrestleMania, WrestleMania 13, I'm sitting in my room, you know, here I am, this new kid on the block, I'm getting this big push, I'm, I'm, my, my head's so damn big, you can't pop it with a pin, and I get a phone call in my room, and they say it's a Jay Leno show. So, yeah, so I'm talking to these dudes, man, and, you know, being in the background, kind of talking to you right now, getting in the background and, and telling them, you know, a little bit about myself. And they're like, you know, WrestleMania, we do so many interviews with so many shows, talk shows and stuff. And um, he's like, well, where are you in the limousine? 
I'll get you up tomorrow, seven o'clock. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I went out that night, man, and why didn't spend four thousand dollars on a suit? Oh, no. On a watch, see some nice gated shoes. I mean, I was decked out. You know I mean, I mean, I was ready. I was, I was, I was ready. And I'm outside waiting with my four thousand dollar suit on, looking good in California. And all of a sudden, Owen walks out with Davy Boy, and they're like, well, "I mean, what are you dressed up for?" So I got interviewed. So it was a good little show. And they got pissed off, man. Like, man, that's bull. You know, I've been in the business for so and so years, and I never had Jay Leno show in it. And they were legitimately pissed off. And I'm like, you know, don't get mad at me, you know. Don't do this about it. I mean, they, they scheduled it. And uh, then Brett walked out. And they're like, damn, I was on there going. And they, they told him, you know, I had an interview with Jalen on show. But like, oh, man, it's cool. You know, Brett was always mellow. Huh. And 7 o'clock came, no limo. And I'm like, what's going on? What's the one was it? was 7 o'clock. And then Owen looks at his wife and says, you know, I mean, what's your limo? It's going to be at 7, ain't it? I mean, limo late. I said, yeah, they said it'll be at 7. And then five minutes took place. You know, I ain't the, 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 the fastest thinker in the bunch. <laughs> and I'm like, how the hell did he know my limo was coming at 7? And I looked at him, and I, before I get a word out of my mouth, they're on the ground. I mean, they were <laughs> throwing up in the bushes. He laughing so hard. Oh, man. And I'm like, no, y'all didn't. No, y'all uh, didn't. And then Brett and them, I mean, they're on the ground, man, at this hotel. I am mean, with tears in their eyes. They got me good, uh, man. Man. And, I mean, they set me up. That's got to be great. I mean, that's, I mean, and, and it's funny, too, because, I mean, you know, obviously, in the wake of his passing, so many great stories came out about Owen and, and, and things like that. It kind of seemed like yeah. not too many people, uh, you know, pull, uh, pull jokes like that anymore. No, they don't. And, and Owen was the king of rhythm, man. He was he was the king. And I, I loved him to death. Him and David Boy, both, I loved them to death. Like when me and David Boy had that arm wrestling contest. I don't uh -huh. know if you remember that one. Oh, yeah. He came out there and, man, they took them stink bombs and put it all over his hand and his body. <laughs> so I'm from luck and I'm smelling his smell. It smelled like 10 pounds of dog doo-doo. And I'm like, oh, my God. God, and I'm like, I can't back out because it's live TV. I got to go through with this. And Owen and go to laugh. If you ever get to watch that on, on, on the internet, watch it. You see them laughing their ass off the whole time. And then we wrestled, and I was meeting my, who was my, my fiance at the time. I was meeting her parents for the first time at night. And once that sneak bomb get on you, it don't come off. <laughs> yeah, right. Days. So I'm like, oh, my God, and they knew that because I told them, you know, I'm going to be their parent, and that's why they did it. And so, man, I was so embarrassed, man. I went up the stairs and I meet a parent, and I was thinking, like, I don't know what. I, I smell like I haven't taken a shower in 20 years, and I'm like, I don't know what our four parents are thinking about me right now. I'm like, oh, Jesus. But, you know, a little riff like that, man. And then... I remember Brett coming in one time and said, man, let me tell you something, I'm mad. He said, don't, don't ever get mad about what Owen's doing to you. He said, let me tell you something. He said, if he don't like you, he won't rip you. Mm -hmm. he, said, he don't, he don't, he don't play jokes on people he don't like. And he said, he must really like you because he's always picking on you. I was like, man, I know, I don't, I don't have a problem with you. It's, a, it's such a weird business to kind of figure out like that because any other company that that happened, they'd be like, yeah, that guy's a jerk. I mean, in wrestling, when, when that happens, it, it does mean they like you. It's kind of a weird, yeah. uh, weird trade off. Uh, so that's dedication, too, to a rib if you're willing to put stink bombs on yourself just to get somebody else. Oh, my God. Get around that. Well, also, that, I mean, in that time period, one of the last things, I, I, always, I always ask a lot of guests that, that have this. You were, you were marketing. I mean, they were Ahmed Johnson action figures, Ahmed Johnson, and, and you were in the In Your House video game. Uh, for you, as, as somebody who grew up watching wrestling, what was it like the first time you saw yourself in a video game or in, you know, in any sort of animated form to just blow your mind? You know what? Don't, don't. I mean, don't don't take this as wrong. Uh -huh. But I've got to be honest with you. It didn't really phase me. No, no, it didn't. I mean, I I think I've always been that down to earth with 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 myself. So, I mean, it was great. Don't get me wrong. It was a great feeling, but it didn't really hit me like I talked to other guys and it hit them. It was like, oh man, you know, when I seen it, it was like this is great. But I I never lost track of who Ahmed Johnson was. I never forgot that this was a kid, you know, came from an abusive home, you know, his father beat him all the time and, and was hungry with ribs showing, you know, I mean, I, I never lost track of any of that. And, and, and I was, 
I mean, I, I've done more charity that I can, I guarantee you, than 10 guys in WWF have done. You know, as far as giving money to, to the women's shelter and feeding, you know, the homeless kids. I mean, that that was my, my goal in the WWE, you know, and I, I accomplished that goal. I think it happened. You know, but it didn't, it didn't, I don't know, it, it's just, it's, it's like everybody else a lot more than exciting me. <laughs> some people take it uh, really, really seriously from, from what I've talked to some people. There's some wrestlers that at the end of the day they can't take off the, you know, who they are uh, from a wrestler's perspective. Exactly. Well, speaking of not knowing who you are, one of the things, you did play somebody else, and I've wanted to ask you about this ever since you did it, uh, the MC Hammer story. And you played Suge Knight. And all I kept thinking was it takes, you got to be tough as hell to play Suge Knight in a movie because that's somebody that, you know, I think anybody else would want to tiptoe around. Tell me about that. Have, have you ever heard from, from Suge or any of his people about how uh, yeah. he felt? Yeah, I, I, I talked to Suge, but I thought before I did, I talked to Suge. Okay. And it's so funny. It was kind of like you said, Steve Ray. <laughs> Steve Ray, before I did the, the thing, Steve Ray was like, man, they couldn't have found I better sure, you know, because, I mean, you know, we both lived in the game line, we both played football, I mean, I mean, it was like, you know, and I got talked to Suge and, and, and got his blessing for what it's worth, um, <laughs> but I got his blessing, and that's only one movie I've done, you know, I've done Walk Texas Ranger, uh-huh. I've done uh, Wooden Execution, Point Man, and a movie called Con, and people don't even know it, I mean, I've done like five movies, man. Do you enjoy it? Doing the movies, some people say it's, it's different than wrestling because there's so many takes to it. I mean, do you, do you like doing the movies as opposed to wrestling? Or? I, I love it, but I love wrestling more. Uh-huh. I, I love doing the movies, but I, I love wrestling more. I, I don't know. I don't know why, but I love I love wrestling a lot more. Movies are fun, but, you know, because, I mean, they, they, they cater to you so much at a movie set. Yep. Yeah. You, know, you get your own trailer. They're constantly knocking on your door. You know, it's gonna get you anything. And when you're in there, I'm mean, gonna wipe the sweat off you. The fans, you know, they got people holding fans over you. Uh, you know, running, getting you on. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. Awesome. But I don't know. Some of the wrestling, it's just if it's in your heart, it's in your heart, man. Absolutely. Well, one of the last things I want to ask you is all of our guests the same question: If you could pick somebody. Maybe somebody that you grew up watching before you got into the business. Maybe somebody who's active today uh, that you just never had a chance to wrestle uh, that you wish you could have uh, in any time period. Who would you pick? That I never wrestled before? Uh-huh. Never wrestled. Mm, man, that's a good question. Um, can I meet two people? Sure. Mad Dog Bell Sawyer and Nikita Koloff. Uh, Nikita. Nikita Koloff and Mad Dog Bell Sawyer. Nikita Koloff was, I mean, I think people don't even realize he was, he was hard. I mean, I remember watching him in, in the mid-80s. He was scary as hell. Yeah, he was, he was another one of my, my idols growing up, you know, Nikita Koloff. That's awesome. Well, Ahmed, before we let you go, we give all of our, all of our guests a chance to speak directly to their fans. So what do you have to say to, directly to all your fans out there who have been watching you from the beginning and, uh, and would love uh, to, I guess, uh, see you in the ring again one day? Well, I want to say, and I'd love to say to them, man, is I appreciate you. They, they have no idea how much a little poor ghetto kid, you know, from the games. They, they, they changed my life on a lot of things, on... Uh, racism or in Christ or the fans have done a lot to make Tony Norris and Ahmed Johnson who they are and I, I just want to thank them man I mean I, I, they're, they're, I can't even put it into words you know people like you you know who you know, I mean you do these interviews fairly and you know I mean I, I don't know I can't I can't thank you guys enough man oh. alright Tony well thank you I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us and uh and yeah, thank you for taking the time to talk to us here today. Thank you.